So, um, as I say, my privilege to introduce Louise Plouffe. Louise is former director of research, uh, International Longevity Center Canada, and contributor, coordinator, I beg your pardon, of the World Health Organization Global Age-Friendly Cities Guide. Um, she made substantial intellectual uh, contributions to the data analysis and the preparation of this report. Uh, this was a huge, huge project. Um, it, it was an important project. It involved governments, NGOs, uh, academic groups in 33 cities around the world. Uh, Louise has been a senior researcher in comparative policy research and with a particular interest in aging and health. Um, she has advised agencies in Canada and internationally. Uh, Dr. Plouffe, you are very welcome. Uh, as you can see from your program, this is a panel structure. The, the format for this next uh, part of the program is a panel. Um, I'll briefly um, mention uh, your collaborators. Uh, Kathleen Godfrey and friends. This is a consortium uh, as represented by Kathleen. Uh, these are McGill graduate students who are active in the multi-generational campus initiatives. And Jim Hamilton, I saw you recently, there you go. Uh, former associate director, Center on Aging at the University of Manitoba. Canada's first age-friendly university, as we know. He sits on the World Health Organization's Strategic Advisory Committee, contributing to the development of their global network of age-friendly cities and communities. On the program, you will notice um, that Carl Helle was to be a member of the panel. Unfortunately, he is not well. I seem to be the sort of doomsday announcer, uh, but he is not well and had to uh, bow out at the last minute. So I will hand over the mic to Louise Plouffe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Il me fait grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Et euh, si vous avez le goût d'adresser vos questions ensuite en, en français, sentez-vous uh, complètement libre. So I'm very, very pleased to be here today, honored. And because I'm bilingual, bicultural, if you feel like and asking questions in French, feel free and you'll, you'll get an answer in English and I can translate if you like. So I would like to invite uh, Jim and Kathleen uh, to the front, please. And just by way of personal introduction, I had the, uh, the pleasure of meeting Kathleen uh, yesterday evening at the, at the re lovely reception that, uh, that Julie and um, Tom, sorry, Paul, Tom, Tony, I'm sorry, uh, hosted. Um, and uh, Kathleen spoke about the, the senior moment. <laughs> Kathleen spoke about her uh, research that she's doing in Kenya for her uh, graduate degree in anthropology, and she's passionate about that research. But she's also, she's also very passionate about the initiative that she has begun at McGill University here, and it's in continuation with other, research, other experience she's had in building uh, inclusive communities here on campus. Jim Hamilton uh, and I go back a long way both Jim and I were involved in shaping the Age-Friendly Cities Initiative for the World Health Organization. And then Jim uh, has played a very active role in implementing the initiative in Manitoba. And Manitoba was the first age-friendly province uh, in Manitoba and Canada, and um, has since taken a very active role in making the University of Manitoba the first age-friendly university in um, Canada. So um, before uh, I pass the, the, the mic to the speakers, I'd just like to mention why I was nodding so much. And that is 
when the age-friendly cities initiative was developed in the mid 2000s at the world health organization there were some key values that underpinned the development of age-friendly communities and that persist to this day and i see that they're part of the principles of the age-friendly university and they're very much part of what you mentioned as well, Bill, in what older adult education and what universities should be doing. The first, principle, the first value is diversity, to respect, to recognize and respect the diversity of older adults um, in their capacities, their interests, their contributions, um, and that diversity must be recognized. The second, second principle is equity, is that we must reach out in, in, um, in our communities not only to seniors from resource-rich communities and seniors who personally have a lot of resources, but to reach out to low-income communities, to other vulnerable groups so that they are included. The third value is, is rights. Age-friendly communities and the age-friendly movement is rights-based, meaning that ageism is not tolerated. It's identified and addressed. And ageism for older adults, because they're the group that is the most, is most discriminated, but also ageism that affects younger generations. Um, the third is intergenerational solidarity. So we say age-friendly, not elder-friendly or senior-friendly. Age-friendly is deliberate because it starts with older adults, but it includes other ages. We discovered that in the, in the research for age-friendly communities, developing communities for older adults were inclusive, are inclusive for other age groups and other needs as well. Another principle is co-design and co-creation. It's the idea that the disability community calls nothing without us, nothing about us without us. So that older adults are are involved in the design, the implementation, the evaluation um, from, from the, of their communities and, uh, uh, and initiatives. Um, and I hear that as well. And also top-down and bottom-up. So for communities, it means the municipal governments, provincial governments um, are involved and have to support because a lot of the action uh, requires uh, official support but also bottom-up, and the bottom-up is the community and its individuals who um, participate as equal partners in the design, the implementation, the evaluation of initiatives. So that being said, I would like to introduce Jim to talk about age-friendly communities, and then Kathleen to talk about uh, the Kathleen and Friends initiative here at McGill. Great, thank you, uh, Louise, and um, thank all of you for um, being here today. Thank you for uh, the invitation, and uh, certainly a pleasure to, uh, to participate in, in your symposium. Um, the challenge I have, like many of us in the room, is glasses <clears throat> that see the right distance for reading a book versus reading a computer screen versus uh, looking down here to see where I slide, flip my slides from. So. I'll be doing a little bit of a, a dance, but um, certainly pleased to be here and, and with Kathleen as well and, and her presentation. Um, what I want to do is just share some lessons learned from uh, our experience uh, in embracing the 10 principles uh, of an age-friendly university. Um, and, and also to, uh, I, I think, share with you where I think it's, it's important to appreciate how the Age-Friendly University Initiative fits into um, a bigger initiative, um, uh, the context of age-friendly communities that, that Louise noted, um, and now the, the World Health Organization thinking broader than communities to age-friendly environments, and I think that that's a really good move in terms of, of how that um, embraces um, the Age-Friendly University initiative and, and also the, the point that this certainly uh, is a global initiative. Uh, we're not alone by any stretch in, uh, in Canada with, uh, with this work. So, um, so I just uh, the other part of it is uh, I, I think the opportunity for, for universities to, um, with the understanding now that we have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15 in Canada, uh, that growing uh, and changing demographic and, and the opportunity that that presents from an age-friendly university perspective, uh, but also from, from an age-friendly community perspective as well. 
So Helen, um, good friend, um, uh, dear person, she's well into her 90s. Um, she's uh, on the board of the International Federation on Aging, which is one of Christine's partner organizations doing work globally on issues of aging, um, and still serves as um, the International Federation on Aging's advisor to the United Nations. Um, so I think that uh, from a, a role model kind of perspective uh, and, and uh, you know, her strong sense that we need to be looking at, at older people as a resource and, and certainly not um, as, as a burden. So the age-friendly environments uh, perspective, uh, what I wanted to share is, is that it goes back, as, as Louise noted, to uh, 2006, 2007. Um, and Louise's role has been a bit underplayed. Um, this initiative would not have happened without Louise, uh, with her vision and, and her knowledge and her style of uh, working with, with partners from, from all around um, the globe uh, as that moved forward. We were fortunate in Manitoba, and, and part of the context for our uh, having moved on the Age Friendly University Initiative has to do with some of our history. Uh, we had a $1 million Community University Research Alliance grant uh, in 2007, which really engaged the Manitoba government as well as the University of Manitoba and, and communities uh, across Manitoba, to the point now where we have about 80% uh, of Manitoba's population living in communities that are on that journey to become more age-friendly. That's not uh, a different figure than uh, Quebec and, and certainly British Columbia and, and a few of the other provinces that uh, have moved forward. Um, in 2012, uh, Dublin City University and, and developing the 10 age-friendly uh, university principles um, helped to uh, broaden the, the thinking, I think, around the world about um, age-friendly communities and, and you know, what's the fit, some of the partnerships and, and the opportunities. Um, and, and the other piece of it that, that certainly the World Health Organization recognized and, and some of the work that I've had the opportunity to continue to do with them in, in developing their first ever world report on aging and health in, in 2015 and, and followed very shortly with the adoption um, of the WHO's uh, global strategy um, on uh, global strategy and action plan that, that follows the, uh, the report uh, is really a roadmap for countries all around the world developed and, and developing to, uh, to move forward. Uh, and, and one of the underpinning uh, concepts within that work is the notion of age-friendly environment. So to move beyond just that notion of the geopolitical community to universities, to school divisions, to uh, police forces, to transit systems, uh, and to start to look more at, at that that um, environment kind of uh, perspective. So um, as was noted, um, just a, a quick look at, at the global piece of it, um, 33 cities, 22 countries. Uh, we had the opportunity in Canada to have four of our cities participate, Saanich, uh, BC, uh, Portage La Prairie, the smallest uh, city in, in the study from Manitoba, Sherbrooke, Quebec, and, and also uh, Halifax uh, participated. Um, Canada played a real key leadership role. It, uh, Canada contributed basically the funding that allowed most of the developing countries that uh, were participants in the study to actually uh, to, to participate. Um, and I think what one of the things that was uh, important about the whole w piece of work and, and certainly Louise's influence is that uh, more than 50% of the voices that were heard in developing that city's guide uh, were the voices of older people. Um, and, and that's really the, the fundamental um, uh, underpinning of the age-friendly concept is the fact that uh, it does reflect the voice and the perspective of older people. And uh, notwithstanding valuable partnerships uh, over the years, the voice of older people, uh, I think, is, is really that fundamental principle that, that needs to continue to underpin it. Um, the other thing that Canada did uh, a year after the, uh, the WHO work was to use the same research methodology and develop an age-friendly cities and, and communities guide, recognizing that not everybody in Canada and not everybody in the world lived in large cities, uh, and that it was important to be more inclusive in, in some of that um, thinking. 
So um, the influence of Ireland uh, lives in, in my work as well. Um, Anne Connolly was uh, w one of the key global leaders in, in the work with Louise and, and myself. Um, and she did a really nice job. There's um, eight domains within the, the age-friendly uh, model, and, and she turned that uh, into words that, that I think just you know, resonate and, and make it a little bit easier to, um, to understand. And, and so when I think about the, the work that we did at the University of Manitoba in relation to the work that, that we were doing um, across the whole province and, and some of my work across Canada and internationally, um, really we want the same things and the same kinds of attributes from an age-friendly university that I think we want from um, an age-friendly community. Um, so to stay living in our own homes, um, to go where we need to go and to be able to go when we need to go and get there. Um, and, and to be enabled by our built and, and by our social environments. And I was going to quiz you uh, in your arrival, and, and most of you are familiar here, but I was going to say, what was one thing that frustrated you as you came on campus today? And what, what was one thing that you felt really, really good about as you came on campus today? Um, and when I think about our challenges of wayfinding and signage and, and all of those kinds of things, steps up into a building and, and uh, a lack of accessibility in many cases. So lots that, that universities can, can contribute um, uh, just like um, the broader community. Uh, we want to feel safe. Um, we want the information we need to, to live full lives. Uh, we want to participate. We want to be valued and, and respected and, and certainly consistent with today. We want to continue to learn, to develop, and, and to work. So I think um, the uh, university initiative fits well with the, the, the bigger picture of that global um, initiative. So just to, to touch quickly on, on those two documents that, that I noted, um, the release of, of the World Report um, in October of 15 and, and the strategy, um, basically what they do is, is they give us a, a new vision for healthy aging uh, with a focus on maintaining functional ability um, and, and one of the, the key underpinnings of that functional ability um, is that creation of age-friendly environments. So what their, their model essentially says is that over the lifespan, uh, people's health will move on a continuum from better health to poorer health typically. Um, and that what's really important is um, probably less concern about managing disease and more concern about the environment, the impact of people in place. And how do we um, maximize that functional ability uh, of people to get where they need to go when they need to go, to do the things that they need to do when they need to do them? What kinds of assisted devices can we create that help to support that? How do we uh, create a more enabling physical environment but at the same time, that social environment as well. So when I talk about those kinds of things, I think about all of the research and all of the opportunities and the R&D opportunities that universities afford uh, in terms of part of that mission and, and part of that, uh, that mandate. So one of the things that, that the WHO has focused in on is from that broader healthy aging perspective, um, we need to be thinking about the investment um, as opposed to the cost. And when we look at cost, health systems, uh, the gray tsunami was mentioned, long-term care, um, social protection, uh, all of those kinds of things. Lifelong learning, one of the key items that was identified in, in the WHO's work. And that what we really need to be doing now is to think about the investment in lifelong learning, the investment in health systems, what are the benefits that we get um, in return, and how do we use some of those arguments to position, as an example, the Age-Friendly University Initiative uh, in, in various settings to, uh, to be able to, uh, to move that, uh, that work forward. So, um, the individual well-being, the innovation, the social and the cultural uh, conditions that, that a university can help to influence and, and that that different vision of healthy aging can, um, 
helped to, to bring to the forefront. So uh, some of the things I just wanted to share a little bit about um, now, the, uh, the University of Manitoba. Uh, we're celebrating this year our 140th anniversary. I continue to say our. I don't work at the University of Manitoba anymore. I was only there for six years, and I was only there part time. Um, but it uh, clearly it resonated with me, and I, I feel some ownership. So. Um, was established in 1877. It was Western Canada's uh, oldest, it is Western Canada's oldest university. Uh, we have 28,000 students, uh, 3,500 grad students, 17% um, are international uh, students. We have 9,200 staff. Um, so you add all of that together and, and we are a community of 36,000 people. Um, so in, in um, 2016, when President Barnard uh, announced that we had uh, endorsed the 10 principles to, to become Canada's first age-friendly university, um, I wanted to present what I've shared with you so far to, to provide a, a little bit of a context to that. How do we get to the point? Um, so the starting point for us was um, at the Centre on Aging, where, where I was, uh, to link up with our um, government and community engagement unit. And the reason for that was we felt if, if this age-friendly university initiative was led by the Centre on Aging, it would perhaps be seen to be self-serving, would have too narrow of a mandate. We didn't have the reach across the whole campus uh, that government and community engagement had, and we didn't have the reach, or we had a reach, but a different reach into the broader community of Winnipeg and, and Manitoba. Uh, so we wanted that support from, from them. We also linked in quickly with a few of the key players that we identified. Um, alumni and donor relations, campus planning, and extended uh, education, um, and work together to, to develop a briefing note to the president that um, ultimately uh, led him to, to that endorsement. So just some of the things that, uh, that we did by way of background, and maybe this is a, a project for your 200th um, anniversary celebrations. Um, the context, we, we talked to the president about uh, the WHO launch of the Age Friendly Cities Initiative, uh, Manitoba's successful engagement with the Age Friendly Manitoba Initiative and, and the CURA grant, uh, Dublin Cities University's leadership and, and vision um, with the, uh, the Age Friendly University Network. Resources, um, we've heard already uh, this morning, uh, it's a challenge, it will continue to be a challenge. And we put forward to the president that uh, we didn't need any additional resources, but certainly this would become a lens uh, as we looked at future spending uh, on campus. Um, we wanted to link into the university's planning framework and, and uh, one of the, the key linkages was in terms of priorities to establish, strengthen and support meaningful connection between the university community and key stakeholders. So that fit well with, with our vision of, of the university uh, as an age-friendly university. And the point about you know, age-friendly communities and an age-friendly university, um, Every community is age friendly. Every university is age friendly. Uh, the question is, how do we become more age friendly? What's what's the opportunity that that, that presents um, for all of us? Um, so the the consultation process, uh, the units that I already mentioned, uh, we reached out broader than that. The Retirees Association, Recreation Services, uh, the two vice principal or vice presidents uh, that were uh, responsible for the Center on Aging, but also for our government and community relations. So as soon as we had that sort of bottom up uh, approach, um, that had two VPs talking to the president and, and showing that sort of broader um, engagement. We reached out to key senior serving organizations in, in Manitoba. Um, and internally as well, uh, Dr. Richard Milgram in, in city planning and our architecture fact faculty, um, was doing some great work, had been doing great work for about five, six years already uh, with his graduate students in city planning where they'd gone into rural communities and they'd gone into a couple of Winnipeg neighborhoods, engaged uh, key players and were helping them design their age-friendly community, their age-friendly uh, neighborhood. So he used his graduate students as a resource to do uh, a campus-wide study. How can we make the University of Manitoba, our Fort Garry campus, uh, particularly more age-friendly? So we had some of those, those really neat resources um, 
And, and then the, the 10 principles, um, again, uh, sh saying to the president that, you know, we're already there. Uh, you know, teaching, we've got the option in aging, and we've got a graduate specialization in aging. Uh, research, we've got 80 research affiliates from every faculty uh, across the two campuses that, that we have. Um, and the outreach and, and engagement, uh, the Center on Aging has been doing a spring symposium for over 30 years. 400 people come out for the day. Uh, generally, uh, at least a third to a half of those are, are older Manitobans. So we had lots of, of things that we were already doing from an age-friendly perspective, um, and it was really about how could we uh, do more, and, and then putting forward the recommendations um, to actually take that um, step. Um, so building momentum, we um, uh, continued to, to grow that uh, committee. Um, and, and one of the key uh, reaches was human resources. Because um, part of an age-friendly university is also to be an age-friendly employer. So when we've got those 9,000 uh, employees, uh, what's that working environment look like for our older employees? And, and how do we make that a more age-friendly um, uh, employment uh, environment for them? Um, career services, um, grad, we've got graduate students, uh, undergraduate as well, uh, student representatives to our committee, security and parking, uh, two key challenges probably for most universities. Um, the accessibility office, our physical plant folks, um, and also our elder in residence, uh, Norman Mead, uh, which is a really um, uh, appropriate uh, reach out and, and thrilled with, with his response back and already looking at how he can bring um, Aboriginal elders onto campus and, and create some more opportunities that way. So that's been a, a really neat um, connection. Um, our first report to the president, keeping that communication going, and um, a photo voice project that um, Dr. Uh, Michelle Porter, who's the director of our center, um, um, set up. And, and so basically the, the photo voice was an opportunity to raise awareness and, and identify opportunities across campus. Uh, committee members uh, went out with their cameras, took pictures. As I just said earlier, what are some of the barriers? What are some of the, um, the facilitators? Uh, we did a focus group um, to sort of discuss that uh, and then developed a summary report and some of that was reflected um, in the information that went forward. So some of the themes that, um, that we identified, um, um, education opportunities, um, senior students, 65 and over, uh, receive free tuition. Uh, it's not necessarily well known though, and it's, it's not well um, publicized. And, and maybe it's something that the university will want to rethink in terms of that growing, changing demographic and that wealth. Maybe we should be charging tuition fees. So, but that's a good discussion for, for the university, I think, to, uh, to have. Um, and, and looking at the barriers and, and the facilitators. So, uh, and often they're both. So we've got a visitor center as soon as you come onto campus from one of the main arteries, which is great that we have a visitor center, but the sign is past the entrance to the visitor center. It's small, and by the time you realize that, oh crap, that was the visitor center, um, you're then faced with making a, a right turn into a roadway, and then you meet a one-way barrier. You can't come back into the parking lot from that road. So now you're going on you know, what's probably a, a one kilometer dance around campus to get your shot back at the visitor center. So, those are the kinds of things that, that we're trying to identify and, and, um, and take into, uh, into account. Uh, age of the buildings. Um, so certainly we've got uh, the Bannatyne campus uh, just on the edge of downtown, older buildings, uh, all of our medical uh, related faculties, except nursing for some reason, um, are uh, on that campus. Um, so a lot of older buildings and, and we all know the challenges of retrofitting uh, older buildings. Our other campus, uh, as um, Bill noted, uh, in, in a suburban setting. Um, so some different kinds of challenges with wayfinding, with transportation and, and parking. Um, um, our brand new um, active living uh, center, which um, is, is certainly one of the attributes uh, from an age-friendly perspective, um, and it contributes to both the, um, you know, the social participation and, and uh, healthy active lifestyles for folks. Um, but some of the challenges that, uh, that we have there, um, uh, brand new building, totally accessible, put in benches, uh, for seating, but no armrests on the benches. Well, 
from an age-friendly perspective, a lot of people need that armrest on the bench to help them up and, and down. So things like that that, that we still need to uh, ingrain uh, as we you know, move forward uh, as a university. Bill also noted the, uh, the golf course land and the opportunity that that affords us, uh, some of the ideas of that intergenerational housing, but also a living laboratory uh, for students, for faculty to be working in an intergenerational setting, social work, recreation, medical sciences, um, lots of opportunities uh, to be right on campus in, in that kind of uh, an environment. So next steps, um, continuing to, um, to uh, reach out. We, we haven't really looked at our Bannatyne, our downtown campus, uh, as much as we've looked at Fort Gary. Uh, starting to form working groups around the 10 principles. So uh, Bill has already uh, stepped up and, and is uh, going to chair a working group on the lifelong learning related um, principles. Um, reaching out to our 80 research affiliates and how do we engage them around the principles and, and building that more robust um, research uh, agenda. Um, and uh, building off of, of some of what we learned from the, uh, that initial photo voice um, project. So that's a, a quick overview and, and sort of you know, wanting to provide that context of um, you know, the Age Friendly University Initiative is part of something much, much bigger. Uh, it's got to reach into uh, the whole world, into developing and, and developed uh, countries. Um, and uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that WHO report uh, on aging and health, I encourage you to do so. Because uh, there's lots in there that uh, that you can use to uh, inform your programming and and uh, McGill's work uh, as you continue to move forward. So I just wanted to acknowledge the WHO for that vision and leadership and and their continued work and and also uh, Dr. Michelle Porter at, at the Center on Aging uh, for her vision and leadership and and now uh, her shepherding of the Age Friendly University of Manitoba uh, initiative. So thank you. Uh, before I go any further, thank you so much, Jim and Louise, for your introduction. This is my presentation. Uh, my name is Kathleen Godfrey. I'm going to introduce myself in, in a slide or two from now. But I am going to sort of zoom in on the McGill campus, particularly, in, in relation to an intergenerational community that I'll expand on. Um, and I think it's so wonderful what we've learned so much so far today is there's so many scales to these conversations, right? The global scale, a national scale, which is so exciting to learn about. Um, and, I, and to be honest, I, I didn't really know what to expect from Christine um, or from Bill, but I've learned so much already. So I'm just very, very grateful to be here and to be a part of these conversations and to keep them going. So um, Marianne has done the wonderful job of already acknowledging the land that we're on. So she's saved me some breath. So thank you. Yes, who am I? I am Kathleen Godfrey. I was in first year at McGill doing my undergrad in 2011. I was a floor fellow in residence during 2015 and 2016. And what that means, it's equivalent to like a Don or a residence assistant. Uh, assistant sorry. Uh, we have a bit of a different approach here. I think the name itself, floor fellow, is is a nice name, because we're fellows, we're friends. And I think that um, our entire sort of ideology of harm reduction, not harm prevention, I won't get into those models, but we do things differently here. And this experience working for two years with first year McGill students has been extremely rewarding and also has guided a lot of my thinking over the past two years and kind of explains why I'm here today, but I'll get into that later. Currently, I'm pursuing my master's degree in anthropology, and as Louise mentioned, I, I, study, um, I study in Kenya. I study conservation among Maasai pastoralists. So my academic work isn't really related to what I'm talking about today, which just means that the reason I'm here really comes from intrinsic motivation, so I'm <laughs> really excited that I get to pursue this passion and these conversations with you today. In some ways, it also is very relevant because I work in an area where you have multi-generations under one roof, learning from each other and caring for, for each other. And that's the norm. Um, I think we have different norms here in our context that I'll expand on a little bit. Community activator is a little bit embarrassing because I don't think 
<laughs> that I am one of those. I think I'm just somebody who really likes people and really likes connecting people. Um, so that's that. That's me. This is just a little bit of a guideline. Today, I'm gonna to talk about my personal experience at McGill over the last six years. I'm gonna talk a bit about community builders on campus and the places that they, they use and they meet on. And then the core of, of this presentation will be thinking about how we can build a better community. And Louise already mentioned that last point, Kathleen's Friends Club, which I just need to say, that was not the original title. It was <laughs> formerly a mouthful, the Intergenerational Community for Learning and Care. It's a lot to say, so we, we uh, decided to change the name. Um, maybe for the better, it's a bit embarrassing, but <laughs> that's okay. So, um, I came from Toronto, that's where I'm from, that's where I grew up, and I came here to Montreal and McGill um, already having family here, so it was kind of like my second home city. And in that way, my experience in first year and in subsequent years um, have been maybe quite different than a lot of students who are coming to this institution. We have a huge international student body, whereas right off the bat I had closeness to family, closeness to many generations, like the lovely matriarch, Nanny, who's now 98. Um, I could always go to her for guidance. My Aunt Jill Harrington, who is sitting there at the back of the room, and I'll bring up many times, she is another reason I'm here, and a very, very dear friend. Um, as well as the younger generations being, because there are people younger than me. Um, <laughs> Nicholas and Chelsea are my, my young cousins, and I've got to see them as well during the last six years, and I've been very lucky to have those kinds of supports familial and, and extended family friend network as well. So I had people coming here. I also had places to gather. This is my Aunt Jill's uh, dining room table. And I know that there are a number of people in this room right now who have come over for dinner parties that I asked to have and that she graciously, she graciously offered her home to use for those purposes. So this was a place that I could go to to you know snuggle up on the couch watch Netflix, and get a little bit outside of the McGill bubble, which I've appreciated, and I don't think, again, that's the, the norm for a lot of students coming here to McGill. I also, oh, one point to make is I think that spaces and places that are conducive to chatter and coziness are kind of uh, central to community building, so I'll touch on that a little bit later. I also, worked as a floor fellow, as I said, and Alex and James are pictured in, uh, in this photo and they're here today and I'm really glad that they are and very thankful for their friendship. But floor fellowing was important in the development of my understanding about like role modeling and what role modeling can look like even though I was only a couple years oh. older than these young people. I had so much to learn from them and I think they had a lot to learn from me. Can we confirm that maybe you learned one thing from me, gentlemen? You too, Kelvin. <laughs> yes, they learned one thing from me at least in, in our time together and they've continued being my friends and people I love to see on campus. Oh, Liam, yeah, Liam too. <laughs> um, so that was a really formative experience for me and also excited me thinking about the youth and the potential of the youth even though I know I am very young too. Uh, but looking at the amazing people who are coming into this campus and into this institution and the change that they are making. So, who are some community builders on campus and where do they do their work? Uh, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but just a few groups, projects, and offices that I, I believe are leaders of social sustainability um, and community building at McGill. Um, I can talk more about them if you want to know about individual projects, but they're fantastic. There's a lot of amazing work being done on McGill, and even just a little bit outside McGill by my friend like Maxine with her Right to Campus initiative. Um, it's happening. Community building is happening, and there are people doing it. There are also some places that we can go to build community because I feel, yeah, you need to meet somewhere. Um, here's a little bit of a list, knowing that some of these spaces will be um, under construction in the new year and, and then gone, I think is something we need to think about, 
I believe that I've identified with a lot of, through a lot of conversations that we lack spaces to build community, spaces that are multi-purpose, multi-functional, um, and not oriented at sort of um, studying, studying in the library. We need different spaces. But I think that that's just something to keep in mind and also relates to you know, the broader goals of, of today and thinking about living together on campus, which I won't get into, but I wish I could. <laughs> so we have people and we have places at McGill, but I do think that there is, is room for improvement. I need water. So over the last six years, my feeling has been that accessible and multifunctional spaces are fewer in number and that we need to be wary of this moving forward. My experience of McGill has also been that faculties and groups and initiatives are quite siloed and clustered and they do all their work so amazingly but independently with, without much communication or connection between them. So I would like to propose today and talk through with you sort of a way forward that I've imagined over two years and in, in many conversations with my Aunt Jill and many other people who are here today. But I think that the reason I introduced myself in all those ways and touched on my experience is that I didn't realize at the time, I took for granted the fact that I got to be around so many people from different generations because they were my family. And sometimes you take family for granted. Um, but eventually we got to a place where I realized that intergenerational encounters and community don't really exist at McGill in the way that we can talk together. Of course, the MCLL is here and doing amazing work, and I don't know enough actually about them, but I'm excited to learn more. Um, but yeah, sort of some questions that came to mind when we were having these conversations, which started two years ago, in that uh, dining room <laughs> that I pictured before. It's, you know, where are the older learners? I didn't know about the MCLL for the last six years, basically, um, which is nobody's fault. I don't think. I think we've all just been developing things alongside each other and now and today is the time where we can make those bridges. Um, the School for Continuing Studies as well is another group I don't know much about, but that's where some older learners are. Um, I'd also like to think about where the interactions between older and younger people are that go beyond administration, sort of these transactions, professor-student relations that have very clear limits. Um, I think that we can and we also must build a better McGill community by integrating an intergenerational ethic of learning and living onto the campus and sort of infusing the McGill experience with that. And I think we can probably all agree that we would like to do that. Not a heads, yes? Yeah. I think we're all on the same page. So I think, um, oh, it's also important to note in my little bio, way back when I hadn't fully developed my thinking on this, I wrote um, multi-generational initiatives, but I'd love for you to cross that out in the program and put intergenerational initiatives because there's a really important difference there. And McGill has multi down. We have many, many different things and many different groups of people, older and younger, on campus with daycare, with the MCLL, but we need the inter, the connections. And so that's why I'm a connector, I guess. That's why I'm here. So, yeah, for me, intergenerationality, I'm actually not sure if that's a word, but I like it. It's all about connections for me. It's about, as Christine mentioned, the reciprocal sharing of expertise, expertise sorry, between learners of all ages. So the 10 principles, which I hadn't read before today, I am sorry, but principle number four is really what I'm getting at here. Um, thinking about mentorship and reverse mentorship, things that um, U, UC, UCD, UD, DCU, <laughs> things that DCU and the University of Manitoba are, are already doing. It's so inspiring to know that this is all possible and that there are people we can talk to to try to move forward with it. It's very inspiring to me. Also, I think intergenerationality comes with different kinds of activities um, working their way onto campus. So beyond just academic, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning, that's fantastic and amazing, and I know the MCLL is great at that. But um, social activities, trying to create some sort of familial 
community um, where students can go to for support. I think that we need intergenerationality, not only because it's, it's the future, it's actually happening. Looking around this room, you're all learners. We're all learners here together. But yes, learning is a lifelong endeavor. And I think the, the, the framework of a third age education was really interesting to me to think about. Um, because I just had, these new terms are coming into my vocabulary and I'm loving them and I'm loving to learn new ones. Um, I think that we need intergenerationality here at McGill because it will benefit us all. I think that speaking, I can't speak for the entire undergraduate and graduate community, but I do have over a thousand Facebook friends, so um, I don't know. <laughs> I think that I've had enough experiences here to be able to say, and enough conversations to be able to say that the, the desire from, from our side, from my side, of the 20-somethings and whatever, um, is, is very much here. And I think that um, intergenerationality comes with such immense potential, um, a lot of which has been touched on by everyone who's spoken before me. Um, a specific point that I want to bring up related to the potential of intergenerationality and intergenerational community building is, is mental health. Um, in my work as a floor fellow and as a human being who's gone through many years of the McGill experience, um, mental health is something that is um, poor mental health, sorry, is something that uh, the student body here at McGill uh, in the undergraduate and graduate um, cohorts are, are facing in a very severe way. And I think that, you know, I mean, I could throw out stats there. One in 10 graduate students has considered suicide. Um, that's scary. And I think that while there are a lot of projects aiming to sort of address this at McGill, I think that we need to be a bit more innovative in our approach to good mental and social health for our, for our younger students. And I think that intergenerationality could be a really wonderful avenue of exploration. I can speak from experience. Um, my Aunt Jill, she has been a constant, a constant um, carer and supporter of me. I remember in my first year, I had drank a bit too much alcohol. And the next day I felt more horrible than I've ever felt in my life, sickness-wise. And the only person I wanted to go and be with was my Aunt Jill, and I called her up and I said, can I come for tea? And she said, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we are just seeking out those, those people who have had more experience, have come from different histories and can teach us so much and can help us by providing a little bit of perspective. For example, in my floor filling work, I think having gone through McGill for a few more years than the first year students, I was able to provide some really important perspective, whether that was about you know, making a decision about your academic major and minor or taking on another extracurricular, and also just in the actual support work that um, I was doing in supporting um, the mental health and well-being of people. So, yeah, intergenerationality comes with immense potential and I really have benefited from it through my familial and, and family friend connections and then also my encounters with the amazing group at MCLL that it's really just the beginning of, of these friendships. Um, of course, everything that I'm talking about and everything that we're talking about here today does operate at a number of scales. So I think that my little piece of the puzzle that I'll expand on is one tiny step forward, but we need to be thinking more broadly, not just the McGill campus, that's step one, but you know, the Montreal, what, what our sort of social norms are in these cities, right? And, and nationally, um, why do we sort of, why do we enclave older learners from younger learners? Um, why don't we have these kinds of interactions and what can we do more broadly to sort of change this narrative? So, where we are right now, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. This symposium is, for me, a launch pad um, up and forward to many more conversations. I think it's phenomenal to have everybody out here, uh, including you know, the under 30s. They're here. 
they're few, but they're here, and they're, they're good quality folks. Um, <laughs> I would want to mention that it is a Friday, and undergraduate students are at the tail end of midterms and have classes. So it's not for, for lack of wanting to be here that um, we have a few less under 30s. Um, they send their regards to you all. So yes, we're just here right now at the symposium, about to jump into, I think, a next phase, and we have a lot of ways forward, as Christine and um, Bill sort of, they kind of just handed it to us. How do we move on from here? Like, here, here's some great initiatives. Come talk to me. We can do this. Um, I think I was doing a little bit of digging, you know, the School of Continuing Studies sort of mandate or subheading, learn, connect, and elevate. So we're learning. I think right now we're connecting, and the elevation is going to start tomorrow, um, when I hope I have a lot of emails in my inbox from you all. Um, yeah, touching on these, these bullet points here, research is being done, communication across faculties and building those bridges needs to be done between the MCLL School of Continuing Studies and the undergraduate, thank you, um, and graduate communities. I think that the future, um, we're in it. <laughs> the future is right now. We have amazing work being done by members of the MCLL like Ruth Rigby and Marlene Chan who asked this question, what are necessary elements for a lifelong learning and living community at McGill? And they've come up with this, this amazing sort of map, and I'm, I'm a visual learner, so I appreciate this immensely. Um, that's outside in the lobby, and I hope you all take a sort of take-home pamphlet with you so you can learn about it further. We have amazing offices like the Social Equity and Diversity Education Office, who run our Community Engagement Day, and I just can't say enough about them and the work that they do. Um, the idea of a helpline that you mentioned, Christine, is so feasible and so needed that I want to start it up today. We just need a name and a logo. Um, but I think that we really are in the future, and so I'd like to just finish off talking about my little club. Um, this, this is a club where we meet to discover, define, and expand um, intergenerational life at McGill. It's a little pilot project that I was able to secure a bit of funding for. Um, and we're just trying to, to get people from different generations in the same room and talk about things and talk about the kind of support and future we want here at McGill and more broadly. So we had our first meeting about two weeks ago and it was an amazing experience for me because even before we had started, there were about, sorry, there were about 12 people in the room and we had met at Ecole, which is a fantastic facility um, right on university. Uh, I won't get into, but they're amazing. Uh, we had 12 people gathered and I looked around doing a little intro and said, you know what, we've sort of, we've won the day because we have somebody from the age of 19 to 85 plus plus. So I would love right now, if you identify in any way as a friend of mine, can you raise your hand? <laughs> Amazing. There you go. It starts with this, right? I mean, if I've met you today and, and, and learned your name or maybe forgotten it, um, Let's, let's keep the conversation going together. I think it was amazing at this first session, my Aunt Jill, last time I'll mention her, um, led the session, and she had us arrange, do some word association with different um, decades of life. And it was fascinating to see what the 50 plus contingent and what the 50 under contingent were saying about each other, and definitely speaks to for the 20 to 30 year olds, this kind of sense of, you know, there's stress and there's anxiety in these times and being at an uh, institution like this is not an easy thing to do. Um, I know that from experience and it was, it was validated in this activity. Also the way that we thought about older folks and their ability to learn and change and adapt, these sort of expectations and, and norms are built into us, so it was amazing to sort of break down those those barriers and really understand how younger and older learners perceive each other and our abilities to learn and to connect um, with each other. It was fascinating. So I think, oh, this is, I mean, that's my email. Please write it down if you'd like to get in touch or join us at our next um, meeting. I haven't sent the email out yet, 
um, club members who are here, but November 19th, 3 to 4.45 p.m. in the Red Path Museum. Uh, that is where our next session will be taking. And if you want to get involved, send me an email and I'll add you to the email list. It's open to anybody, and uh, the only limitation would be if we get so big, I don't know where we'll, where we'll meet, but that's McGill's, they need to figure that out. They need to give us more spaces. <laughs> um, I think if there's a takeaway from this, uh, at McGill, we do have the people that are building community. We have the learners of all ages here. We do need more places. That's something that, it's not my expertise, but we need them. And I think that we do have a common intergenerational vision because we're all here today. And I think it just took me a bit of time to realize that we needed this. And I'm sure it's going to take a little bit of time to, for other people to get involved in this way, especially in, in the undergraduate and graduate community because we are in this state of immense stress and pressure at this school. But it's not because we don't want to be here. It's, it's capitalism, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so I think the McGill intergenerational community is happening right now. And it's only going to get stronger from today onwards. So thank you so much for listening. Sorry for rambling. Thank you, Jim and Kathleen. And we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um, not so much a question, but um, I had not realized that the, the major focus is around um, age-friendly universities. I just wanted to say something about the pre-university situation. Um, in Quebec, we have, um, because of minority language funding, we have on the Anglophone side a network of community learning centers, um, usually attached to a, a youth sector school, operating after school and evenings with programs, leisure and learning activities for people across the, the lifespan. Uh, so I think they have tremendous potential for the kind of intergenerational connections that we want to promote at a younger age. Um, but just to, to scaffold on what uh, Kathleen was saying about the distinction between multi-generational and intergenerational, most of these uh, activities, uh, Spanish courses, badminton, whatever, are perhaps multi-generational, but they're not truly intergenerational. They don't tr uh, really connect young and old in a way that um, meets the, the potential there. Schools are largely um, closed systems, and it's only a few that welcome, I think, volunteer seniors to help out. But I think the potential is huge. Other questions or comments? It's just a comment. Yes, over, over the. Okay. You wanted to speak? Yes, you want to speak? Um, I'll wait till she's finished. Okay, thank you. I, I, I wanted to just comment that I'm a member of MCLL and I was taught, brought in by a friend. I know that word of mouth is the most important thing, but I'm listening to this wonderful number of organizations that are developing for age-related uh, people, and I don't ever get any e email or any e information about what is available as a senior that I might be involved in, and I wonder if there's any a better way of getting to the seniors. We've got this wonderful experience available, but how do we know about it? Thank you. Yes. Um, just uh, I love this idea of the intergenerational university. Thank you. Um, I'm one of those strange people that actually likes having grades and taking exams and feeling that I've achieved something at the end of my course. So one of the most interesting things I did in the last few years was to join an undergraduate Latin course um, at McGill, which was a great experience. I was three times the age of the students in the class and a little older than the professor. Um, but they were wonderfully accepting. It was a wonderful course. Um, the only drawback was that it was very expensive. I had to pay student fees. So I'm wondering if there's a way we can 
there's a need to get around that somehow so that to be able to take a course at McGill without having to pay several hundred dollars for one course. Yes, that, those two issues, the one about, about fees and about costs for taking courses and the other about getting information to, uh, so that seniors can become, older adults can become engaged. Um, in age-friendly communities because it does exist in Montreal. There are something like 822 municipalities in Quebec that are a part of the Municipalité Amis des Aînés initiative led by the Quebec government. But obviously more needs to be known about the municip Municipalité Amis des Aînés and how older adults here can engage. Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm a uh, high school teacher. I'm actually here with my mom over there. Um, and I just wanted to say that I would love to have all of you uh, senior people come into our schools, talk to our students, because there is a untapped source of information, a wealth of information here that our students could uh, benefit from, because I think they kind of get sick of listening to me and other teachers constantly droning on about the same things. And I think hearing it from a different perspective, an older perspective, would be very rewarding and very refreshing. So if anyone is considering that, I would love to get the ball moving on that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, one of the things that struck me was what Kathleen had to say um, was that she had been on the campus for six years and didn't, had never heard of MCLL. And I think that that is very true about most um, de various departments at McGill. But I'm wondering, do students still use, or uh, rather read, the campus newspapers that come out? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, there is a venue that maybe there could be an article or so about the senior learners on campus and a method of connecting us. No? I think that's a fabulous idea. I myself do not write for any publication. I don't, I don't know if anyone here does James, Calvin, Liam, Alex, but I'm sure that we have some connections and I would be very eager to, to get something published about the MCLL, about this symposium, um, as we think about it into the future, for sure. It's doable. It's so doable. We just, we just need to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's a good venue for us to interconnect. Yeah. Why don't you write about Kathleen's Club in the campus newspaper? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, one, one thing I could suggest for MCLL to promote, uh, promote yourselves is in Dublin City University, I put a brochure into the student orientation packs at the beginning of every year, and I also have an opportunity to address at orientation all the students and new staff coming onto DCU about the Age-Friendly Initiative. So everybody knows coming into DCU that the students have that, and then we have regular opportunities to contribute also to the newspaper, so it's completely embedded. So it might be a way for you to promote it within the university and get people involved. I actually have a bit of quite interesting uh, information. Um, we run courses on healthcare. It's about the fourth or the fifth. And there's been a change wherever they're being publicized. We now have two PhD students who are actually taking the course. When they first approached me to take them on, I wasn't so sure. I mean, when I was in practice at McGill, yeah, that was part of my, my duties. But I did take them on and they're giving the presentations, they're being challenged. One's from Brazil, one from Korea. And I must say, uh, I asked them, how did you hear about this? Because we don't publicize uh, what we're going on. And it is from the bulletin, and uh, we have a bulletin. It is from uh, online. And our courses on healthcare, which um, uh, have led to uh, talks being given in the city and the community because of their focus. So I think, from my perspective, uh, looking at the future of MCLL, absolutely important that A, we, in my view, that we join the networks because I think that that's in everybody's interest. Um, and most important, that we publicize and we make sure that the students, both here and at Concordia, I know there is something at Concordia as well. I'm not sure what, don't know anything about it. 
Yeah, excellent. Yeah, this is working now. Um, I'd love to add to that or maybe expand on that because I think what you brought up in, in your presentation, Christine, um, about you know credits being offered to, to undergraduate or graduate students is kind of an important detail that we need to be thinking about. Um, the difference between graduate and undergraduate students and our time is, is vast. I can take many days off and still write my thesis by the end of this year. Undergraduate students are in five, six, four um, courses at any given time, combined with the immense pressure to be in, engaged and involved in extracurriculars. So these, these challenges are very real and so not to, I don't want to have to incentivize younger folks and in undergraduates to be a part of this community, but it needs to be sort of built into our thought process going forward because time is, is finite and I mean, I just know so many young people who don't have time for something more. If there was a credit option, that would be amazing because they need the credits. They need the credits to graduate in whatever amount of time that they need to. So something to keep in mind, for sure. Okay, we're a little bit over time now, so I was, would suggest that you continue the conversation with Jim and Kathleen over lunch. Thank you. Thanks.